Texas. So, so my wife and I, we rented, we leased an apartment right near the office building. In a very nice area. Right. So of course, naturally, I have to get a TV. But when I think of how many hours, 10 or 20 years ago, one would have to work to buy a suboptimal, I mean, a TV right. today that you would throw away, yeah. Uh, might have been a hundred hours or a couple of hundred hours or more. I hadn't really thought about it. I've seen I've seen kind of articles written about that. And now maybe it takes two right. or three or five hours, depending on what you earn to buy a TV that's massively improved. Well, I, I can go back even uh, even further in time. Uh, I think my first TV was in 1953, and we probably paid 300 dollars. And and those days, it's probably equivalent to uh, three thousand dollars today. And and the TV was, as you say, you wouldn't even uh, look at it now. But I remember when we got our first Sony Trinitron TV that my dad won in the 70s. <laughs> Before that, we were about the only holdouts that still had a black and white TV in the neighborhood. So I guess that's what happens when you raise five boys. Well, good news yesterday I'm in the big picture. Uh, it seems like we've made really good, strong progress towards trade deals, uh, bilateral deal with Mexico. Uh, now Canada wants to come to the table. There's a little more favorable talk, maybe between China. Is this a result of? Here's what I think that's happening. And you can tell me, you know, like my teacher used to tell me how wrong I was all the time. So prior to Trump, and again, this is I'm, I'm staying away from politics, so don't call me wanting to argue about politics. It's not the point I'm making, but it's, I'm just a little more factual. I think factual. Uh, we had higher tariffs, and now we're talking about, you know, it seemed like we were subsidizing the world in a way. In other words, if you look at our average tariff pre-Trump versus China, uh, South Korea, Europe, Mexico, et cetera, um, it would certainly give the appearance that we were subsidizing the world. Then uh, we cut corporate tax rates uh, down to 21%. Prior to that, we were much higher than most of those other countries. Uh, again, putting us kind of in a disadvantage per, per uh, area, we're, we've cut deregulation. Suddenly now, uh, everybody kind of wants, seemingly wants to come to the table. We've struck our first deal, Canada. Is the fact, and, and kind of along with that, I guess I can't ignore the, the kind of the energy independence theme here where we're now the largest producer of petroleum products. I don't, I'm not going to say oil, but petroleum products, and we're a net exporter in some areas. That seems altogether seems to have changed the balance of power in the world where everybody's going, hey, we might want to get on board of this because the US now is really showing its strength as an economic power now that they're not subsidizing a bunch of the world, trend towards lower taxation, lower regulation, and now everybody's, you know, I mean, look at the sea changes in Saudi Arabia, women can drive now, and all. I, I don't think that's an accident, the fact that we don't need their oil as much as we used to. Right. So I guess I agree with uh, most of the what you said. He said the one uh, term you used. I don't think we were subsidizing the rest of the world. Uh, trade is not a, as we all know, is not a fixed sum game where we lose and they gain. Uh, both sides gain, uh, and uh, we've always gained. So I think the the change is is probably good in the sense that uh, uh, Trump uh, raised uh, both expectations and fears about uh, trade and. and those are kind of being dispelled now. So I view it more as going back to a, a new normal as opposed to a somewhat better situation where we're going to gain a lot more from other countries and they're going to not gain as much for us. Uh, but the, the problem that uh, I, th I think the president doesn't understand is that uh, we don't necessarily... Uh, Fred, this is a one-hour show. <laughs> if you're going to go into what Trump doesn't understand. Well, uh, our, our fate is not exporting things to China. Of course. Uh, we're not going to build TV sets here and sell them yeah. to China. Or, or should we? Yeah, yeah. And, and the fact is that uh, it, it, there's a whole whole bunch of issues about uh, maybe you know, the Chinese uh, taking advantage of our uh, technological uh, infrastructure, things of that sort, and, also, and, and those are probably legitimate claims. But I think the trade issue, uh, in, in my mind, I would like it just to recede and not, not think about winning or losing. And, and, and maybe that's what's happening. And maybe as a result of this, is there any, I just thought of this question, is there any good reason theoretically to allow one country to have a, a, a much higher tariff on our goods than us on um, their goods? Is there, I mean, what, well, the is there a good is, reason for that? Not, I, I, from their standpoint, it's probably a bad idea. Uh, the idea of protecting your industry to, 
uh, promote it is a losing game in the long run. So the country with a high tariff actually is misusing their resources internally. And it's not good for us, it's not good for them, but we can't necessarily change what other people do. One of the, the fallacies is that, well, the way you uh, grow is to protect your industry against foreign competition. And uh, the, the last 30 years have shown that's not true. Uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China have all gained by uh, uh, trying to make it on the world market, not protect their industries against foreign competition. It, it does think seem like things are changing. I think in Mexico, I don't, I don't want to overplay that. I, frankly, I don't have a perspective, a sense of proportionality of how big of a deal that is. But certainly yeah. Canada is already here. The, at least uh, people from the folk, trade folks from Canada are here trying to now say, okay, once you get your bilateral agreement ironed out, we want to yeah. go kind yeah, of- Yeah, there's one them. kind of big uh, asterisk here, and that is that uh, uh, most democratic countries uh, have trouble dealing with the agricultural sector. Uh, it's subsidized many places and is subsidized for political reasons, not for economic reasons. Yeah, we, do, we do plenty of that. Yeah, but not, not necessarily through, uh, for, you know, sugar obviously is an example. Sure. Right? We, the, uh, the United States is probably not uh, well suited to grow <laughs> sugar, but we, we do. Yeah, it's a politics amazing. It's amazing. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, uh, in just a second, but it, it would appear, it seems like from a recessionary standpoint, when I look at the past 10 recessions, the 10 recessions since the end of World War II, and it seemed like when I relate it to the stock market, because that's always a part and partial of what is part of our clients' portfolios in the broadest sense. Um, you look at eight of them, uh, bear markets, which are 20% or more decline. Um, so, uh, you know, we're brought on about recession. Uh, two of them weren't, but it certainly seems like there's a somewhat of a direct connection between bear markets and a slowing declining right. economy but the the uh even if you if you take a kind of uh pessimistic out, outlook the good news would be that uh a recession probably is going to be an old-fashioned kind of recession where you have a slowing of the economy maybe a tick up of unemployment not a catastrophic kind of thing like 2007 to 2009 so if you remember back in the early 90s and the early 2000s we had two recessions so it, it hardly even uh had a blip in terms of unemployment or much of anything. And of course, Donald Trump said if he's impeached, the stock market will crash 50%. I, the data doesn't, the yeah. historical record certainly doesn't well, I suspect play that, that out yeah. because I think of uh, Bill Clinton's impeachment, uh, impeachment trial in uh, 98. Yeah. The S&P 500 was up 30% that year, and the next year was up, I think, around 5%. But of course, when Nixon was impeached, the market fell about 23%. Yeah. But that, I, that's my belief that when markets are trending up, they're probably going to continue to trend up. It's probably, it's, we probably overplay this, how right. important the president or yeah, it's hard to is. Too. I'm, 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 I was thinking I'm glad I'm not a, I have you on a market timer the last month or so, because I wouldn't have uh, uh, foreseen <clears throat> what's, what's happened the last several weeks uh, with the market going up really substantially when I thought but, there was a, a, quite a bit of uh, negative things to, uh, in, in the works. Well, I mean, that, and that was one of the things I was going to talk about maybe at the end of this. I think that takes people by surprise. It's not as if there hasn't been a lot of bad news this year. We've had emerging markets, real crises. We've had increasing in interest rates. Uh, we've had a lot of political, legal turmoil. Uh, there's been a lot of bad news just this year, and here we are sitting at all-time highs. And I think it's, you know, isn't that because what you've always said, by the time you're sitting around thinking about how this is going to impact the market, the market's already moved on and probably is, either overdone it one way or another. Right. Now, I, I guess I was surprised, though, about the uh, jump with the uh, uh, trade agreement. I, I thought that that would sort of incorporate in and it would smooth <coughs> it over, but the market did actually respond to that. Yeah, and I, my view is I, I use a simple capitalization model for what I think the stock market is it, you know, fairly priced, overpriced. I don't use it as a tool at all as far as in the backdrop of what we do for clients. But I like to have my own personal sense uh, particularly when we, for since 2008 or 2009, the market's overvalued and going to crash at any moment. And at the end of 2017, even use reflecting higher interest rates, I had a stock, broad stock market that was probably undervalued by 10%, and now earnings have gone up by 10% since then. Right. So uh, I guess in some ways it doesn't surprise me, though I, I don't sit around forecasting things and I don't talk about it. And if a client would ever ask, what do you think? I might share some feelings that I thought we were in a consolidation phase. Pretty typical. You do this for 35 years, you get a sense. It's not really usable. 
But you wouldn't tell them to. Uh, it's not usable. Suggest their it, uh, portfolio. It's not usable. Well, I just, I guess there is that dark side of me that I do have feelings, yeah. and, and 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 this doesn't surprise me because uh, fundamental, you know, the valuations are reasonable, earnings are great, uh, stock prices can go higher for either valuations can increase about what people will pay for a dollar of earnings, and right now they're at a twenty-five year. If you look at forward, like what are earnings going to be out of the next twelve months? That is tracked every day, you know, and uh, the 25 year average is about 16 and a half times earnings. And here we said it about 16 and a half times earnings. So it doesn't scream that stocks are, uh, are cheap by any means, though I still think they're undervalued. Uh, but again, I, I think you always are wise to bring up the point. It's one thing to talk about these things, it's not another thing to act on. Them. Well, the other thing they're, is they're not actionable. But undervalued, overvalued, I mean, if you really believe the market uh, values what the market says it is, then. Of course it is, and it doesn't care who the president is, it doesn't care who the administration is, but when the economy is still humming along, we haven't, I think the other thing is we haven't really had any economic extremes. Yeah. We've had a lot of economic extremists telling us, you know, right. we, you know we're going to collapse at any time now for the last eight or nine or ten years. Uh, but it seems to me that the markets are not concerned about, you know, our things, uh, even though they're far from perfect, it doesn't seem they don't care about is it good or bad? It, it, it seems like they, when I talk about the market, it's a collection of overlapping right. billions of minds is, are things getting better or are they getting worse economically? And this is sort of, uh, I'm not sure whether it's uh, true or not, but uh, President Obama's worst, uh, worst nightmare, he thought that he spent eight years getting the economy all set to go, and, <laughs> and the don't guys can't put it out, and now Trump walks in. And, <laughs> and, 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 and what's your take on that? I mean, uh, well, no, it's, either it's, one it's, should, no, it's just not, not anywhere true or false for right. any other politician. Yeah, it's just kind of like bad luck. You yeah. know, it's kind of like, darn it, I just had this thing here ready to go. At least I'm sure that's what Obama thinks, yeah. and it may be true. Well, the same um, thing can be said for uh, uh, Bill Clinton in uh, 1993. He walked into a really great situation. Uh, he walked into a massive secular bull market. Which, I mean, again, so you could say, well, uh, uh, George H.W. Bush created that, but that's probably not true either. Politics, politics. I, I just it doesn't make sense to uh, let your ideology drive your investment portfolio. That's for sure. I've seen that fail time and time again. Well, David, believe it or not, we're going to start talking to you a little bit uh, <laughs> because you recently wrote a blog as retire about retirement planning rule of thumb that is so often talked about and published and written about. It, and you wrote an article why you can't trust, uh, you can't rely on the four percent rule. Uh, what was the motivation behind that? I mean, we see this for uh, even most. Prospective clients walking in seem to have some awareness of of, of this. I'm a, my ability to potentially spend four percent from my portfolio and increase that by inflation every year, and it's just kind of this rule of thumb. I call it a rule of dumb, but rule of thumb that lingers. Yeah, I think the motivation was honestly, like you said, just the fact that it is so prevalent in the world today. I mean, I just did a quick Google search to see. You know, I, I searched. How much can I withdraw from my investment portfolio? And I think probably 99% of the results said, oh, you can basically withdraw 4% from your portfolio. They referenced the 4% rule. And I'll explain kind of okay. probably a little more exactly what that means or how it works. Um, and I think going along with that, the more I've been in the industry, the more I've developed retirement plans for clients, the more I've realized that rule really doesn't work. For the vast majority of people, or I should more than saying it doesn't work. work, I should say it's probably not necessarily the best option for the majority of people. And I think that that just makes sense because I think really anything in life, but financial planning especially, there is no one size fits all because everyone's situation is different. Everyone has different time horizons, different portfolios, different goals, um, and all of those things are going to impact how much you can withdraw from your investment portfolio. So I thought it was really important to basically say. You know, write an article that says, here's what the 4% rule is. Here are some of the issues with blindly following it and things to consider when you're actually trying to develop a strategy for how much you're going to withdraw from your investment portfolio in retirement. So uh, why don't you get into what the 4% rule, kind of where this all came from? Yeah, so it originated uh, from research by a guy named uh, William Bangin. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I think it was like early 90s, like around 1990. 92, I think. And basically, and he was a financial advisor from what I understand, and he basically wanted to test out, okay, 
how much can I can my clients safely withdraw from their investment portfolio? I mean, that's a huge issue for retirees. And the way that he went about testing it was he said, okay, well, let's just look at historical data. Let's look at, and he used 30 year periods. And he, you know, there's nothing magical it's about arbitrary. that. He just said, you know, if you look at a 65 year old couple and we want a conservatively long time horizon, I think 30 years is pretty reasonable. And he tested every 30 year period in the history of the United States stock market, uh, rolling one year periods. Okay. And basically what he found is that even in the absolute worst 30 year period, you could have withdrawn 4% of your starting portfolio balance, increased it every year for the rate of inflation, and you wouldn't have run out of money. I think it was actually technically 4.15% and then he rounded right. down a little bit right. to give a tiny margin for error. So that's how it originated and it came about. So uh, right off the bat, what that tells you is it, it's based on a worst case scenario. So it's a super conservative assumption. So it'd be like building a building as if uh, even in this town uh, for the worst catastrophic earthquake ever to be held, you know, happen in the United States or maybe in the world. And you think, well, that may not apply to Champaign-Urbana. And so while it's true, it might not be the best design. If you may be vastly overpaying, and we'll get into that because in, in essence, so part of what the 4% rule does is you do pay, you're probably going to pay a huge price for that conservatism. Right. And I think the, the first thing I even mentioned is just the, the big issue is that it's a fixed portfolio withdrawal. And you're taking that from a variable investment portfolio. So I think just fundamentally, there's something wrong with that, that you're not really adapting to the actual investment results that you're achieving. So the earthquake analogy really isn't probably not very very useful because so you, can't go, you can't go back and uh, that's true. redo the earthquake. Well, that's true. Uh, I, I guess that was my, you know, not so, uh, clever way of saying, you know, it's kind of like being overly conservative you're, you're you're living as if uh two global recessions or depressions in a row are a, a sure thing and so what are some of the other shortcomings right so i'll actually just go in order i pulled up my article here because i think i jumped the gun a little bit on a couple things but the first one and i i think the the biggest flaw in this or it's not even a flaw honestly his research was super valuable it it added a lot of like um understanding to the financial advisory community in terms of how much you can withdraw from an investment portfolio. But like I said, it's based on a 30 year time horizon. Not every retiree has a 30 year time horizon. Right. I may retire at 70. If you retire at 70, maybe you have a 20 year time horizon. Well, that makes a huge difference in how much you can withdraw from your portfolio because even without returns, you, uh, you know, you could, you could for a 30 year period, you can spend a few percent a year with no returns and never worry about running out of principal. <clears throat> you may slide into zero, but over a 20 year period, you know, it's a, it's a much larger. Exactly. So, rate. you know, even if you apply the same methodology where you try to figure out the most conservative scenario for a 20 year period, I don't actually know the data, but it might be closer to like 5% or something right, it would like be. that. It would be. It's significantly higher and, and in, for 10 years, it's even higher. Correct. And so you need to actually continually update. And the flip side is also true to a certain extent. So if you are, are someone who retires super early and you're in your forties and you retire, you know, the 4% rules based on a 30 year period, you might have 50 years. Typically what I see in financial plans is that the withdrawal that's possible for longer periods of time, usually like 40 plus years, is I would say about a half a percent lower than that four percent rule. So right. kind of and what there gets a point of like perpetuity where you say you know whether it's a hundred years, 50. it's a big difference between ten and thirty, but there's not near as big a difference between thirty and forty year time horizon. Exactly. That that's what I was going to say. But time horizons matter. It, they matter a lot, and I, I think that's the the first thing that people need to be aware of is that you can't just blindly follow this four percent rule because it's based on a specific set of assumptions and your reality may not match the assumptions that this analysis was based on. In fact, it's likely not. It's more likely that it won't than it will. Right. And uh, what would the next one be then? So the next assumption in the analysis, which I didn't mention, is that he used a portfolio of 50% stocks and 50% bonds. And really the stock portion was only the standard and poorest 500, which is the largest 500 companies in the US stock market. And then for the bond side, I think he used five-year treasury bonds. 
Well, that's a big assumption as well, because the asset allocation of your portfolio is going to impact how much you can withdraw from your investment portfolio. So there's actually kind of two different levels to this. The first one is if you have a different ratio of stocks to bonds, and that's probably the biggest influencer. Now, what's kind of interesting is people might intuitively think that, okay, almost one for one, if I increase the stock allocation in my portfolio, I can spend more because it's increasing the expected returns in my portfolio. Right. It really doesn't work that way because you're also increasing the uncertainty around the returns of your portfolio. But a slightly higher stock allocation can marginally increase the sustainable withdrawal for your investment portfolio. And that's on the front end. And what a lot of my research that I've done over the last year says where the big difference of that allocation spending comes and where it may make a lot of sense to choose an asset allocation beyond 50%, which might be a standard issue advice, 50-50 balanced portfolio, half in stocks, half in bonds, or fixed income, income producing securities is if you if you could use or ideally if you you know look here's the number you can spend when we do our research it's based on the methodology here's what you can spend today but there's a really good chance that you'll be able to actually spend more than that because we're probably not going to end up with horrible and what my research suggests is it can make a significant difference in spending over a lifetime or over the first half of your retirement lifetime that allocation move but as far as day one, whether you're 50% stocks is what you, mo you mostly find, or 60% or 70, or maybe sometimes even 80. Okay, it may, instead of 50,000 a year spending, it might be 50,500. It's not, there's no significance to it. But here's where it does matter. And this is the trap that I think retirees are more likely to fall into, okay. is a retiree who says, you know, I'm a conservative investor. And what they mean by that is, almost their entire portfolio is in bonds. And usually if you look at what you can withdraw from a portfolio with a primarily bond allocation in your portfolio, it, it really steeply drops off once you drop below like 40 or 30% stocks. It really drops So off. if you're below that and you start relying on this 4% rule because you read an article that says that's what you can do safely and not have to worry about it, you're really setting yourself up to potentially run out of money. But I think it's financial suicide on the installment plan. And so unless you have so much money that you could put your money in treasury bills and you still couldn't spend the money, even with, even net of inflation, uh, you know, that's the rare individual. So would it be fair to say then, and, and, and we'll get back on track here, that generally you find for the majority of people, they're probably going to want to be somewhere between 40% stocks in 80. I think so. Beyond those limits, it kind of has its own problems. Right. And, and in future research, this is kind of aside from the 4% rule, but they've tested basically that sustainable withdrawal for various portfolio allocations. And I think really the 100% stock portfolio has the highest in kind of the median outcome uh, for spending. But the problem with that is if you have a 100% stock portfolio and you have a big smasher bear market, you have nowhere to run. You have nowhere to take your withdrawals from. Uh, right. And now you start the markets down. And so when, instead of uh, eating the eggs from the golden goose, you start eating the golden goose. Right. And that's the sequence of returns risk that we may talk about today. We may not, but it certainly comes into play here because the order of returns are probably more important than the return itself. Meanwhile, we do have a caller. We have Jim on line one. Jim, welcome to On the Money. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to. Jim, I'm going to recap the question because we're not sure on Facebook Live if people heard the question. Jim says, suppose you uh, you inherited a million dollars. It's tax-free. 
you get to invest it. And it's 2008. You intend to use the 4% rule, spend 40000 a year. I'll even take it further and adjust it by a few percent, 2 or 3% a year per year after that with some reasonable expectation of a, a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds. And Jim, correct me if I'm, if I'm not characterizing your question right. Would that have worked? Is that what you're asking? Okay. Yes. Right. Correct. Right. Yep. Yes. Okay. Uh, it could be a little bit different. Uh, I'm just thinking through that. I've actually done the research because we have a certain, we have rules that we follow. Uh, and I always also compare it to the 4% rule. So I do historical audits and, and uh, it would have worked. The 4% rule would have worked with a few percent increase. Now uh, you're asked a different question. Uh, what if we earned exactly 4% a year? You should have preserved, assuming there's no fees involved uh, and, and forget about taxes. It's just a, it's a tax free portfolio. Uh, you should have preserved your million dollars. It's hard to, I think it's hard to invest in that. 2008 to 2018 period, if you had 50% stock and you end up with uh, a fourfold increase in stock values. You're, right, you're but, what, but I think what Jim's saying is, forget what the mix is, right, Jim? Yeah. You're just saying, you, God said you get 4% guaranteed return every year since 2008. And now, well, then you would have, uh, it could start the beginning of the year, you have a million dollars, you get 4% interest throughout the year, you have a million forty at the end of the year, assuming you spend it at the end of the year. So there's a little quirk in there because if you take forty out at the beginning, you could have slightly less. Uh, but it's it's insignificant. But you would. So assuming you're guaranteed 4% a year, you know, that would have to mean that that differential is primarily, primarily the fees. Okay. I think the, the main you thing. You guys reading that the same way I am? No. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Fred. I mean, I think if, if someone had turned over a million dollars to me in 2008, I put half of it into stocks, half of it into bonds. Say the bonds just sort of held right, their own right. and, the, and, and, and the stocks. Uh, quadruple in, they went up sixteen and a half percent a year. The broad U.S. Market. I'm going to make four percent and have a lot of change left over. So I'm I'm talking about a different. You, you are. I think Jim's saying he's his re, re, irrespective of the portfolio, the return right. has been four percent a year. Yeah. Is that right, Jim? Well, okay, so then it depends on your asset mix, but it's somewhere around a balanced portfolio. I've done, yeah, I've, I've done the work. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that you would have preserved the full million in this case. You would have preserved your lifestyle uh, if you didn't make any changes. Um, I think of things in the way we make changes. Once the plan becomes overvalued, the client can spend more money. So that's most of the research I'm doing. Um, I've actually seen updates to the 4% rule with Michael Kitz's, and all I know is the 4% rule since 2008 or 2009 has worked quite well with a balanced portfolio where you probably have close or more than you started with uh, using the 4% rule because you had a bond portfolio that probably earned a couple of percent a year and you have a stock portfolio that earned 16 and a half percent a year. Now this is from the bottom. So you're talking about 2008, you went through the decline I would say that my expectations would be pretty close to a preserved 
using a 4% rule, a 50-50 portfolio, you would, have, you would have come somewhere close to preserving, not, not net of inflation, nominally, your original million dollars. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm guessing a little bit here. This is what I do every day. Uh, David would probably laugh and say, this is all Dad does. Is he likes to do simulation and test all these things. I live in a world of simulation. Uh, so I'm pretty confident that what I'm stating is, is going to be fairly accurate. Well, one way to do it, Jim, is, uh, Visit with me sometime, I promise you. Uh, you can talk to anybody that's ever dealt with us. We don't push people. To, we, I don't want to push people to visit with me. Then I got to resell them every six months. However, since that's the world I live in, it would take you and I about 15 minutes to come up with your exact answer. Okay? Okay. Hope it helps. All right, thanks. All right, David and Fred, sorry to, uh, you know, I, maybe Facebook's not picking up the, the question here. So anybody listening? Yeah, we're having that, some uh, audio something. issues. And it was just a, a, a kind of a historical audit question that, that Jim had is, if I filed a 4% rule on a balanced portfolio, would I preserve my portfolio? And my answer was, you should have pretty much, if not enhanced it, preserved it some. I was going to say, I think it depends where you're measuring from. If you're going from right exactly. before the, the crash, and, and he said or right, 2008. Now, or right after. It the worst part of 2008. Years. January 1st, I'm assuming January 1st, you, you would have been, you would probably preserve most, if not all, of your original million dollars using the 4% rule. Because Jim didn't talk about spending an additional 2 or 3% a year to offset impact of inflation. Let's get back to your article. We have, uh, you know, maybe uh, 10 minutes or so left, David. For sure. Uh, what are some of the other issues with the 4% rule? Well, I think we can talk about the second layer. We kind of almost alluded to okay. this, and Dr. Gertz did a little bit, but, you know, there, it's not just about stocks versus bonds. You also have to look at, okay, well, what types of stocks and bonds am I invested in? How diversified is my investment portfolio? Um, if you look at Dane's research, like I said, he was only invested in basically the biggest companies in the U.S. stock market and five-year treasury bonds. Okay. That's not a very diversified portfolio. I mean, 500 sounds like a lot of companies, but they're all in the same asset class. Right. So if you diversify away from that, it can kind of smooth out some of the ups and downs of your portfolio to a certain degree. Right. It doesn't eliminate them by any means and can actually increase the sustainable withdrawal rate. And Bill Bangin actually updated his research a little bit later with basically the same methodology. But all he did was add small company stocks in the US to the investment portfolio. And he found that that 4% safe withdrawal could be increased to 4.5%. So just adding that one asset class increased the safe withdrawal rate by a half a percent. Or no, probably even 12% additional spending, you know, from four to four and a half percent. Now, if you add in additional asset classes, like you start adding in international stocks and you add in some real estate or REITs, um, you add in additional bonds, it may marginally increase that as well. But you do get into diminishing returns pretty quickly as you start adding more and more asset classes to your portfolio. Sure. But it does so, have an impact. But it does have an impact. So that's something to be aware of. Most people do not just own the S&P 500 index and five-year treasury bonds. If you're a properly diversified investor, you should own a lot more asset classes than that. Okay, and what about, uh, if it's so conservative out of the gate that we're assuming Armageddon and that's where the rule, that's where the spending comes from, that if we have to we have to assume that we're gonna get those worst returns, then, then there's gotta be a rub there. Right, so by definition, most of the scenarios are not gonna be anywhere near the worst case scenario. So if you get even mediocre or even just average returns, you're going to be significantly underspending compared to what you could spend. In other words, if we knew you were going to get average returns, right. you could spend a heck of a lot more than 4%. Substantially more. But because you don't know that and we're banking on the worst case scenario, you're starting at 4%. So really, ideally, you would have some sort of methodology in, in place to increase your portfolio withdrawals if returns are above average. And so it needs to be a mechanism, and it, and it lacks that mechanism that says, wait a minute, we really don't want a system that if we're going off the cliff, we keep going off the cliff with it. We want to make adjustments, and the 4% rule doesn't have any adjustments, does it? Right, so it opens you up to two uh, scenarios that you really don't want, which is underspending and overspending. Now, the overspending, I think, is a, a relatively low likelihood, but there are people out there that say, 
you know, because of market valuations and because interest rates are low, maybe the 4% rule doesn't necessarily hold as well as it could have, you know, using past historical right. data. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But it, just the fact that you're taking a fixed withdrawal opens you up to that possibility of overspending. Um, and like we already talked about, more than likely you're going to end up significantly underspending if you follow the 4% rule. Because you're, you're living as if you're getting basically a 1929 through 58 market scenario. But most of the time, returns are a lot better than that. Right. And so they're, they're really, if you really want to live your complete life, there has to be a mechanism in place that basically what I call them guardrails that say, look, uh, we weren't expecting these good, this good of returns. Uh, therefore, we are overfunded. And therefore, here's how much more you can spend. And the other side of that is, wow, we really did work walking to the bus all the first few years, which is key. The first three to five years are really important. And without making adjustments, you know, the, the fact is, if you look at most simulation, <coughs> you'll find that most financial advisors will come up with a success rate of if we do this a thousand times or 10,000 times, 85% of them exceeded the goal. Well, there's 15% of them ran it into zero. Well, it's not really going to be zero uh, because you're going to do something. And this is the frustration I have with the financial services industry. They really can't describe what it is they would do and how it would impact you. And that's, of course, where our research has come in that really provides our clients with a lot better understanding of that. But it really misses that mechanism, doesn't it? For sure. And just to put a little perspective on it, they have actually analyzed kind of the various outcomes and percentiles of following a 4% rule. And basically what they found is 96% of the time, if you followed the 4% rule for 30 year periods in the past, you would have ended up with more money than you started with. Much more. Now that's not adjusted for inflation, so it might actually spend like less than what you have. Right. But yeah, 96% of the time you would have at least maintained your starting balance. Right. So that sounds like, I think a lot of people would hear that and say, well, so what? I'm a conservative person. I don't need to live a, a lavish lifestyle. I don't see what's wrong with underspending. But to me, that represents money that you could have, even if you're not going to use it on yourself, you could have given away while you're alive so that you get to see the positive impact that you're having on the people around you or the institutions that you care about, as opposed to leaving a giant lump sum when you when you die. Yeah. So here's, look. There's a cost for everything. You don't really ever eliminate risk. You trade one risk off for another. And it's really, if, 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 and the next part is what, what do people do then? I'm, I'm going to preface it with, uh, you know, this, this is where a really good financial advisor will, will price things for you. Okay, I understand, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you're a conservative investor. You probably can't even spend what we told you you could spend. Would you have any desire to leave? Uh, additional money to people you love or institutions you dearly love while you're alive or maybe when you wake up in heaven. And many times when they see that differential of being able to do what you just talked about, it's a good enough reason for them to instead of, be, instead of being 40 or 50 percent equity to move out to 60 or 70 percent equity because it can have a significant impact in that area. But uh, go ahead. So what, what are you guys, you know, so what are people left with to do? So the 4% rule is kind of sort of useful, but not really practically useful. Well, yeah, it's useful if your scenario or your specific situation matches up well with the assumptions that went into Bangin's analysis. If you have about 30 years to live, yet, you know, obviously you're guessing and you have about a 50-50 portfolio, that might be a reasonable place to start. Except, Dave, if you, Except for if the you simulated data instead of historical, because we have limited historical data, and you assume that we could have periods, 30 year periods that are worse than we ever had, that opens you up to maybe a one out of six chance of actually running out of money of lifestyle prematurely. And that's not very good odds. That would, that would really bother me. So in an ideal world, what you would do is you'd come up with a starting withdrawal rate that accounts for your specific time horizon. Obviously, again, an educated guess at how long you're gonna live and accounts for your specific asset allocation. And that's just the starting point. And then equally as important is you, you need some sort of process in place to adjust your portfolio withdrawals based on the returns that you actually earn. Instead of just assuming a worst case scenario and never making an adjustment, you need to just basically you set a reasonable starting withdrawal rate and then you make adjustments based on the returns that you actually earn over your lifetime. And people should ask their advisor, what are those mechanisms? What are your withdrawal policy rules? for making changes and have you tested them 
under simulation to make sure that they are going to do what you expect them to do. Now, unfortunately, 99% of the advisors out there are going to be able to say, well, we don't know. But we have a pretty good idea yeah. of what we might do, you know, to make those changes. But we really have no real concept of what that means from a probability of your life. Well, I suspect, I don't know your client base, but I suspect that most of your clients aren't shooting for exiting the zero. They're, no. uh, they're uh, expected to have uh, something left. That gives you even more flexibility because you, you can always uh, draw on your uh, what you expect to bequeath to your heirs. Exactly. If things don't go right, it's, it's not your problem, it's your. Exactly. And, and, and all the commercial software that's available, really the only difference is David said, they really don't, you know, instead of a 40% stock for, portfolio versus 80%, I'm going to a little bit extreme, uh, your, your lifestyle at the beginning is not going to be all that much different, but it may multiply the ending legacy value. Well, not everybody wants to multiply that, but as you picked up on, that really reflects potential additional enhanced lifestyle. And we've been, we've been able to develop the tools that allow us to show the clients what that might mean to them in a practical sense. Right. So, but you're right. Nobody wants to go in the, into a plan thinking I'm going to slide in with my last dollar. Some people acutely say they do, you know, you know, and jokingly say they do, but they really don't because we need to have a margin for life. Well, exactly. That's what I was going to say. If you knew exactly how long you were going to live and exactly what your investment returns were going to be in Any each order year. of those returns then you could actually build a plan to do that. But the problem is we don't know that. So if you live longer than you anticipate or if returns are, are particularly bad, you might have planned on going, you know, to zero on the, the year that you die or the day you die. But really you go to zero five years before that. You obviously don't want that scenario. So, so Fred, uh, any updates on the, I guess there wouldn't be any updates on the state of Illinois. It's not as if things change uh, in the landscape from our structural no, problems. Other than there seems to be so. more and more articles showing that it's more and more. It's always the next article is always it's worse than we even thought. It's, it's, well, actually, it's uh, a little bit uh, really good news. I guess Chicago's uh, bond rating went up a little bit, and a few things like that. I think the uncertainty now is the election is uh, you know far from clear that uh, Governor Ron is going to be reelected. So there's always an issue about. What comes next but you're not really worried that even though Pritzker has said he tends to maybe try to go for a progressive and higher taxes for the wealthy that from a mechanism standpoint that's politically and mechanism wise that's not all that easy to it's do. unlikely right so, so so that I mean that makes me feel a little better right. you know maybe I'm one of the evil people that doesn't want higher taxes but right. well um, yeah, it doesn't stop higher taxes but probably the uh, millionaires tax is probably not not gonna happen so if there is a so a, so what you're saying, or is this what you're saying, is we might go from 5% to 7%, but it's going to be across the board. Or, if, or some uh, variation. That's some variation of right. that. Not, uh, not at 12% not, for uh, okay. people over a million. Is that because we have to politically, uh, not just political will, politically structure? Well, they have to have a, a constitutional amendment, which okay. is unlikely, and then you have to approve the legislation. And uh, like it or not, uh, high-income people have a, a pretty good... Uh, Say if I and, and so when I when I hear him, and I'm not being, I'm being trying to be apolitical yeah. here, uh, but when I see this millionaire stack on people like he says me and yeah. and Rauner, uh, that's probably fair. Yeah, I don't think I, to be up to be fair. I don't think Rauner's ever talked about the millionaire's tax. He's talked about a um, very progressive uh, tax, which we don't have now. Okay. What's your take on the progressive versus the flat? Just we have thirty seconds. Is one better than the other, or more ideal? Uh, Progressive, I think, is uh, probably more appropriate for the federal level. Uh, high rates progression for states is counterproductive because it's, people have the option of uh, taking some uh, action to avoid that. Okay, so money moves where it's treated best yeah. from state to state, but you it's easier. You know, it's easier to move to from Illinois to uh, Indiana, this from Illinois to New Zealand. So. Okay, well, another edition of Paul Rudy's on the money. Thanks for listening. Thanks for the calls and thanks for the text. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Thanks for listening. Well, if I don't understand the question.